atoms, molecules, and stoichiometry. Oh my, welcome back to Ace Chemistry Chapter 2. Let's head right into it. So we have the organization, the presentation, just a little bit of stuff. And we're going to start with the first section, which is the relative masses of atoms and molecules. So we have the forgettable definitions are so easy to confuse, all that kind of stuff, but you have to know them. You can, Ace really likes to give these out as um, quick definitions that could be like two or three marks. We have the unified atomic mass unit, which is one twelfth of the mass of a carbon-12 atom, that's all. But a lot of the other definitions are based on that. So we have the relative atomic mass, which is the ratio of atoms of an element to the unified atomic mass unit. Basically, it's the average of isotopes when you look at the periodic table, that is the relative atomic mass. We have the relative isotopic mass, which is the mass of a particular isotope. So if I have carbon-14, it's going to be 14. If I have carbon-12, it's going to be 12. And this is yet again compared to the AMU, the Unified Atomic Mass Unit. And then we have relative molecular mass, which is the ratio uh, weighted average mass of a molecule, which is covalent. So pretty much if it's H2O, it's going to be 18 because it's the oxygen, which is 16, plus the two hydrogens, which is 18 overall, compared to the atomic mass unit. Then we have relative formula mass, which is the ratio of weighted average mass of a molecule that is ionic. These have the same definition, but they're called different things. So ACE might ask you the difference between a molecular and formula, or like they might ask you like similarities and differences. That way there's one mark for the similarity, one mark for the difference. The only difference is that covalent versus ionic, but the math is the same, right? Honestly, there's no easy way to memorize these. I just put them on flashcards and put them on loop. That's the only way I can really understand the differences too much, like, in order to remember them, like, on spot on the exam. And that was all they wanted for the first section, so the second section is the mole and the Avogadro constant. So the mole is the mass of a substance containing the same number of fundamental units as there are uh, atoms in exactly 12 grams of carbon-12. So this is somewhat based on the unified uh, atomic mass unit, the AMU, but it's not exactly, it's a little similar. I don't think you have to know that definition, it's just what it is. And then uh, you generally need to understand the applications of it, not necessarily the definition. Then, but we also have the Avogadro constant, which is N sub A, or just L. Uh, I don't know how they got either of those letters, but don't ask me. Uh, it's the number of particles equivalent to the relative atomic mass, or molecular mass, of a substance. It applies to atoms, molecules, ions, or electrons. So the value is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. So that's really, really, really huge. You should only use that if you're finding really, really tiny things, atoms, molecules, electrons, etc. right? And the, what's it called? The transformation is 6.02 times 10 to 23 atoms are in one mole. That is the conversion, that's what I meant. Yeah, it's conversion right there. That's all they want out of that section two, but I promise the other two sections are going to be longer. The syllabus was just short on those ends. Now, now we have formula or formulae. Uh, charges in general, you can tell them from the group number. Group one is going to be plus one. Group two is plus two. Transition metals are the purplies. They vary. Some of them are constant, but ultimately it's like only two of them, I'm pretty sure. Then uh, group 13 is going to be plus three. Group 14 is plus four. It's just the last digit. But however, on the other end, we have uh, group 18 is zero. Group 17 is negative one. Basically, you're doing uh, 18 minus that number when it gets towards that anion, or that negative side. And the way you write transition metals is you would write the name of the transition metal, for example, iron. You'd write the charge of it in parentheses using Roman numerals. I wrote three using III. If you don't know how to use Roman numerals, let me know and I'll make a video about it. And uh, we have oxide at the end because it, there was oxygen at the end. So oxygen, we know is in group 16, so it has negative two charge. Uh, Fe, it told us it has a 3 charge, so Fe3 plus O2 minus, and we crisscross those charges, so Fe2, O3. That's how we write it. If we're going from formula to words, CrF4, uh, we know F has a 1 minus charge because it is in group 17. So that means the Cr gets a 4, they crisscross. Pretty much you have to reverse crisscross if you want to get back to normal again. And this is definitely for the ionic compounds and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and it would form chromium-4-fluoride. You would just put the 4 in the parentheses once again. 
So, a lot of stuff to memorize, Loki. So, uh, we have these two transition medals that you can memorize and just know those. Sometimes they expect you to know those. They're Zinc with 2 plus and Silver with AG plus. And there's a bunch of polyatomic ions. There's nitrate, sulfate, carbonate, hydrogen carbonate, phosphate. There's also hydroxide and ammonium. I think you should know all those. If you can memorize more, you can. That'd be great. But I think they only put those on the syllabus. So those they expect, but they could perhaps toss one on there. And it's just helpful if you're already familiar with it. And basically how you would do this is you would have an element with a polyatomic ion. You would reverse crisscross and just name it. That's all you do. Not really too, too bad. And you, when you crisscross, you have to make sure to crisscross those charges. If we have boron carbonate, 3 plus, 2 plus, you have to make sure B gets a 2, carbonate gets a 3. It really, really matters in your calculations. So how do we balance? Balancing isn't too hard. It's hard to do without like going through examples step by step. If you want more practice, more examples, let me know and I'll make an entire video on it. Uh, we, for this one, we have CH4 plus O2. It's turned into CO2 plus H2O. This is some combustion happening here. On the left side, we can count how many uh, elements we have. By the left side, I mean left side of the arrow. So we have one carbon, four hydrogens, and two oxygens. We look at the subscript, and we would also look at the coefficient if there was one. And on the right, we have one carbon. We have three oxygens, because we have two from the CO2, and we have one from the H2O, and we have two hydrogens. So we're going to try to balance it a little bit. There's four hydrogens on the left side. There's only two on the right side. So I'm going to add a two coefficient, try to make that even out. I'm going to add more and more coefficients until it's all balanced out, pretty much. So now let's talk about ionic equations. Ionic equations are a little niche. We don't see them too, too much, but they're still really important to see and acknowledge. It comes into one of the later chapters in A-level. So it's equations that only include the atoms that change their charge. So there's no spectator ions. Spectator ions are ones that have a constant charge. For example, hydrogen is always plus one, so that one's always a spectator ion. And this one we have zinc plus copper sulfate. It's going to turn into zinc sulfate plus copper. So we're going to start with uncrisscrossing and writing out any charges. If an element is by itself, it has a zero charge. And of course, if an element is by itself and it does not have a charge present, if it wrote Zn2+, plus, then it would be 2+. plus. So we have Zn by itself, copper 2+, plus, sulfate 2+, plus, turns into uh, zinc 2+, plus, sulfate 2+, plus, and then just copper by itself. So we see sulfate stays the same, so we're just pretty much crossing that out. Then we have the zinc plus copper 2 plus, turns into zinc 2 plus plus copper. Not too bad, not too ugly. It takes some practice to get used to though. Okie dokie. Next we have the empirical formula versus the molecular formula. So the empirical number uh, formula is the most simplified way of writing a compound. If I have 4 versus 2, I'm going to write that as 2 versus 1. This must be done for all ionic compounds. And it's typically done for the covalent compounds, though it can depend based on which kind of chemistry you're doing. When you get into organic chemistry, you're more likely to not simplify the ratio. And that's the molecular formula, which is the most accurate way of writing a compound. It is all the atoms that you have present in there. I, For example, some the empirical and the molecular is the same exact thing. CO2 is CO2. 1 to 2 simplifies to 1 to 2. However, when I get to other more complex things like uh, maybe I have glucose, if I have, geez, like pretty much any really big molecule, it's more so common to keep it um, unsimplified. That way you can better understand it and better understand how it would be drawn and that kind of stuff. So there's benefits to each, but empirical is, so, but ionic compounds are always, always empirical, no exceptions. So here's a practice question that you can find on the exam is when they give you the mass of stuff and they tell you to find a formula. For example, they told us in this random compound X, there are 180 grams of carbon, 20 grams of hydrogen, and 160 grams of oxygen. So what we do first is we divide by the atomic mass, which is found on the periodic table. So we divide by it, we got 15, 20, and 10. We're gonna divide by the lowest number. The lowest number here is 10. So 15 divided by 10 is 1.5, 20 divided by 10 is 2, 10 divided by 10 is 1. Then we're going to multiply until we get nice, even numbers. And not necessarily super nice and even, as long as it is less than or equal to 0.2, or greater than or equal to 0.8, then you can round it. For this one, we had just had to multiply by 2, then we get 3, 
4 and 2. We have to multiply everything by 2. That way it's all equal. We get C3, H4, O2. But there's also another way they can give this problem. They can say there's a compound that's 52.14% carbon, 13.13% hydrogen, and 34.73% uh, oxygen. Yeah, I blinked on that word for a second. So we start with the percents, and we're still going to do the same step. We're still going to divide by the atomic mass on the periodic table. I divided by all of those. Uh, oxygen was an infinite number, so I just put dot, dot, dots. Uh, and then we're going to divide by the lowest number between all the elements. For this one, it was oxygen at the 2.171. So we have all of our numbers. Carbon was not exactly 2, but it was able to round it to. And hydrogen is still 6.56. We multiplied all of them by 2. And then we got 13.1 uh, for the hydrogen, which is less than the 0 0.2 for the 0 0.1 part. So we rounded that 13. We had C4H13O2. So we also have a hydration. There is water crystallization, when compounds can form crystals which have water as part of their structure. That's really cool. But how do we tell when a compound's water in a structure? Well, we have hydrated compounds that contain the water crystallization. It's for, like, it would just tell you in the problem. There's hydrated copper 2 sulfate, which would be C, C, which is copper, sulfate. We put a dot, and then how many waters there are. The waters is going to depend on the kind of molecule you have, and also just how many are there. There's also anhydrous compounds, which are compounds who, that do not have this water crystallization. Most compounds are anhydrous that you work with in chemistry. Now we have the reacting masses and volumes of uh, solutions and gases. And I say AK the math section. Every part has somewhat been math section, but this one has the least amount of explanation. The most you have to practice practices to know this. If you have to round the answer, use three sig figs. Often, they'll say you can use two sig figs or four sig figs, and they'll accept three because it's only one sig fig off. So always, always use three sig figs unless the problem says otherwise, okay? Coolio. So we got percent yield. Percent yield is, I thought I was going to get uh, $50 this week from working, but I only got $30. So I would do $30 divided by 50, I would multiply by 100%, and that would be my percent yield. And it works the same way in chemistry. It's your actual yield over your theoretical or expected or calculated yield, whatever you want to say, times 100%, and then you get your pretty little percentage. So in this one, they would give you percent yield or the actual yield, or they can also give you theoretical yield. It really depends on the problem. Theoretical yield you can use uh, through stoichiometry, through knowing how much you expect from things. You can do some balancing, you do some, all that kind of stuff to know how much. If I have one mole of this, I expect two moles of this, but I actually only got a uh, half a mole and that kind of stuff. We also have gases and stuff like that. Uh, one mole equals 24 decimeters of gas. Coolio, coolio. So if I have gas, I can divide by 24 and get my moles back. Also, it's really, really important that you know the difference between decimeters and centimeters. If uh, you can't remember, you can remember King Henry died drinking chocolate milk or King Henry died doing crystal meth, whichever you prefer. And essentially from that, you can see that the decimeters are 10 bigger than the centimeters, but it's also decimeters squared and centimeters, not squared, cubed versus centimeters cubed. So you have to divide by 10 cubed. So yeah, that's how our conversion works out, where it's going to be 24,000 um, centimeters of that uh, gas and all that kind of stuff. Generally, we want to work in decimeters. Decimeters are a lot prettier. We use decimeters for concentration. We use decimeters a lot, a lot more than centimeters. And speaking of concentration, concentration is measured in moles per decimeter. They didn't write it uh, correctly at the top there. I used an image. It's uh, moles dm negative 3. You have to remember that negative because it's moles per decimeter cubed. Uh, a dilute solution is when you have a low concentration or like a low solute or a high volume. Pretty much if I have a gallon of water and I put uh, one, one gram of salt in there, that's really not a lot. But a concentrated solution, which is either a high solute or a low volume, I have a really tiny cup of water and I have 10 uh, pounds of just sugar I'm putting into there. I'm sorry I'm using American terms for a science class, but I don't know the British terms. So you can see here, uh, also this picture on the right, concentrate where you have a bunch, bunch of it, 
dilute, you don't have too much. Almost imagine you're adding food dye, and you like you're adding red food dye, and you make it a light pink, or you make it a super bloody red, pretty much. So we also have the limiting reagent or the excess reagent. So the excess reagent is the compound that we have excess of, or we have a bunch of, or in the terms of the other one, we have almost infinite of. And for the limiting, it's the compound equation as not in excess. So say we need um, two eggs and two milk for uh, to make a cake, and I have five eggs and two milk. That means the eggs would be in excess and the milk would be limiting. And that's generally how it goes. The milk is only is the one restricting me from making more of it. And we can see it through sto stoichiometry. So they might tell you, uh, you have one mole of carbon and one mole of hydrogen. And which one is going to be your excess, which one's going to be your limiting. So we can see that one mole of carbon makes one mole of CH4. Maybe the, the, because we have two moles of hydrogen required in here, that means it's going to make half a mole of CH4. So the carbon would be excess, hydrogen would be limiting. It's really hard to give examples here without actually doing the work. So if you actually do want more worked out examples, let me know and I will genuinely work them out, okay? <laughs> So, but thank you for watching. If you have any recommendations, suggestions, wants, desires, needs, you're screaming, crying, throwing up over a chapter, let me know and I'll make a video about it. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.